I assume, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Azim. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Bite Medicine um, and a junior doctor in central London. And we're very, very proud to be continuing our um, series of webinars and our collaboration with the GKT MSA. So it's great to be here once again um, for another high yield webinar on general surgical emergencies. This is kind of a, a slight adaptation for a previous webinar that I've done for just, you know, bad medicine alone. Um, so we'll be covering a key, a couple of key emergencies, but I, I hope everyone is keeping well, most of all. I know some people are going back to placements properly now and things are moving forward in the right direction. So um, it's, uh, it's great to see so many of you working so hard and I know how difficult this time has been. So do keep it up. Um, I'm sorry for these wonderful images behind me. We've just moved into some bite medicine offices, which is very cool. So um, that's what all of these are. So um, yeah, without further ado, let's crack on. Obviously, if you have any questions as we go along, um, do let me know. You can ask it in the Q&A. But uh, yeah, let's let's move on. So um, the target audience is not second year. That's a great start. The target audience is um, any medical students, so clinical year medical students and physician associates. Um, and we're going to be covering two key general surgical emergencies. So that is small bowel obstruction and large bowel obstruction. We get the opportunity, we can cover part two as well, where we cover kind of additional uh, general surgical emergencies, so things like appendicitis, diverticulitis, etc. Um, throughout this whole journey with us, with each other this evening, um, we're going to be going through kind of important differential diagnoses, going all the way from pathophysiology, um, all the way through to investigations, management, prognosis. We'll ask a bunch of, we'll be going through a bunch of questions together, the multi-step SBAs, um, and we'll be using Mentimeter as, as we usually do, um, for some interactive questioning. And then obviously, if you have any questions at the end, I will take some of those as well. So before we dive in, just a reminder for you to please check out our question bank. It is multi-step SBA approach based on kind of the most recent theories within medical education to improve your retention of knowledge um, based on the most recent guidelines. So just uh, head over to app.bymedicine.com to take a look at that alongside our textbook, which is updating every single week um, as well, based on those guidelines. And just for you, um, I'm actually in a competition with Schwabe, who's one of our other co-founders. We released uh, voucher or promo codes for everyone attending today and all of the GKT collaboration webinars as well. So if you did want further discounts, obviously loads of our content is free anyway, but if you wanted all the premium stuff as well, I think you get 20% off or maybe a little bit more um, with this code here. So, so I can win that competition. That would be great. And if you want additional free stuff um, and for money off as well, then it's kind of a win-win. So uh, do use that code um, if you were thinking about uh, purchasing our premium uh, subscription package. So let's crack on then, shall we? So general surgical emergencies, obviously, as we all know, general surgery is a very broad surgical specialty. It's a specialty that I'm very interested in. Um, and I'm starting run through training in general surgery from August, actually. So it's a, it's a specialty that is very close to my heart. Um, and as we know, a lot of patients with general surgical conditions often present with abdominal pain. So before we start diving into um, general surgical emergencies as a concept, we need to be aware that not all conditions that cause abdominal pain are general surgical conditions. And that's a, a, a really important concept to, to consider. Because obviously we have some really key general surgical emergencies or conditions highlighted here in red. So things like your cholecystitis, appendicitis, hernias, diverticulitis, bowel obstruction, etc. All of these are general surgical conditions that present with abdominal pain. But as you can see, there are loads of other conditions here which also present with abdominal pain. So hyalonephritis, predominantly usually managed by the medics with some antibiotics. We've got colic managed by the urologists. Got pneumonias managed by the medics, kind of lower lobe pneumonias down there. We've got testicular torsions, which are you know usually managed by urology, but um, in a lot of trusts, particularly district general hospitals, who don't have 
um, urological services on call, often managed by the general surgeons as well. And never forget your gynecological causes, so your ectopic pregnancies, your uh, ovarian cyst ruptures, etc. Also remember that there are other key causes of um, other key general surgical emergencies as well. So up here with this lightning bolt, we're thinking about um, things like esophageal perforation or kind of Boerhaar syndrome with your really severe retrosternal chest pain, shortness of breath as well. And then also um, kind of general surgical conditions involving your um, vasculature, particularly so things like mesenteric ischemia, ischemic colitis um, as well uh, are, are key general surgical conditions. So the key take home message from all of that rambling really is, you know, not all intra-abdominal, not all causes of abdominal pain are general surgical. We have to always think outside the box as well. Um, and like even peptic ulcer disease, which usually presents with, peptic, uh, with uh, epigastric pain, um, is often managed by kind of endoscopy, but also, um, you know, if, if a peptic ulcer perforates, then we'll need general surgical input as well. So that is, uh, those are just a, a few key points. I'm getting a, a couple of messages in the Q&A about view settings to view, um, to, to view the camera separately, but uh, I'm not really sure how to change that. If you've gone through app.biomedicine.com, you've then got a link below that separately to Zoom. So it will then take you separately to the Zoom app and that should resolve any issues anyway. So do try that and hopefully that will fix your problem. Okay, so that's a bit of an overview. So let's start off with our case number one. So we have a 60 year old female who's presented to the emergency depart department with central abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, and this pain has been coming and going, also known as kind of colicky, colicky abdominal pain. Um, she's had a previous open appendicectomy. Examination reveals central abdominal tenderness with tinkling bowel sounds. Um, and abdominal distension, the rectum is empty. Those are the patient's observations. What do we think about this lady's observations? Happy, unhappy, and why? So you can just say it in the chat if you'd like. And take a look. What is wrong with this lady's observations? Yes, tachycardic, we're unhappy, absolutely, agreed. She's tacky, um, sats are okay, but definitely that blood pressure, you know, 100 over 70, I'm not particularly happy with that, and a, and a, and a bit of a fever as well. So uh, I'm not particularly happy with any of this, to be honest, tachycardic, hypertensive a little bit, and uh, temperature on the high-ish side. So um, those are a few key things to take note of. And if I saw this patient in the emergency department, and hopefully you're imagining yourself in the emergency department now, we need to follow an A to E approach, resuscitate this patient, and investigate, investigate what's causing her symptoms. So based on this history we've been given, and the fact we know what this webinar is on, hopefully you already know what the most, the most, uh, the underlying diagnosis is here. But now we need to think what is the most likely cause of that underlying diagnosis. So hopefully you can all see this screen. If you head over to menti.com and type in the code there at the top, 83469302, and we can all answer this question together. So have a think, and obviously no one else will see your answers. It's just, um, there you go, sorry. Hopefully you can see that screen now. Um, the code there at the top, 83469302, and I will let more of you answer. The most common cause of the underlying, well, the likely underlying diagnosis. Fab. So a nice, uh, relatively straightforward one for uh, just to start us off with. So absolutely correct. Bowel adhesions, it is. So uh, bowel adhesions, most common cause of small bowel obstruction. 
Now, hopefully you're thinking of a few things, you know, A, how do we know this is small bowel obstruction and not large bowel obstruction? B, what are bowel adhesions and how do we get them? Those are probably the two big questions you're thinking. Um, and I will answer both of them. So why do we think this is small bowel obstruction rather than large bowel obstruction? Well, you have to think about it anatomically. The small bowel is proximal to your large bowel, which means when there's a physical obstruction in your small bowel, you most commonly, um, in an earlier stage, present with vomiting. Nausea and vomiting are early features in small bowel obstruction because of that anatomy. Where, whereas that, those are late features in large bowel obstruction. Large bowel obstruction, earlier features include, you know, complete constipation, so obstipation, i.e. you can't pass flatus and you can't pass feces. Those are more apparent in large bowel obstruction. So, and this, this kind of colicky abdominal pain where the pain is coming and going, you have to think of a small bowel, the peristaltic action against that obstruction is what's causing those symptoms as well. Bowel adhesions form usually after a previous operation. So once you've had an operation, particularly open procedures, where the you know, bowel has been handled, adhesions can form between bowel and those can then cause obstruction. And that is the most common cause of small bowel obstruction. And this patient has had a previous open appendicectomy, which has probably caused bowel adhesions, which has then caused her small bowel obstruction. Tinkling bowel sounds are characteristic of mechanical bowel obstruction. Um, and then obviously she's tachycardic, hypotensive with a low grade pyrexia as well, which, which are relatively uh, commonly seen in small bowel obstruction. And I will explain why in a moment. So what is small bowel obstruction? Well, it's a mechanical or functional obstruction of the small bowel. And essentially it's then just gonna prevent the normal passage of digestive contents. Hopefully you've, both, you've all seen that we've written mechanical or functional, which means that either there is a physical obstruction or there can also be no physical obstruction and a functional issue. And I'll explain the difference between those two in a moment. In terms of epidemiology and risk factors, well, it's pretty rare in those without previous surgery, but not obviously not impossible. There are causes of small bowel obstruction, which are not related to previous surgery. Um, as we said, bowel adhesions are the most common cause. Therefore, you would expect the majority of these patients to have a previous surgical history. But if you haven't got a surgical history, you would often be described by general surgeons as having a virgin abdomen. Uh, your abdomen is free of scars. Previous surgery increases your risk by 12-fold, and the average age is 60 years old. But the key risk factor to always remember is going to be previous surgery because of the formation of those bowel adhesions. Now, a little bit of basic anatomy, because this is where we really need to, to leapfrog off. So the small bowel, does anyone know in the chat roughly how long the small bowel is? Or the small intestine? How long is the small intestine? Daniel said two meters, some said 12 meters, so a big, big range there. So the, the small intestine is roughly six meters-ish. So it's called the small intestine, but it is pretty long. And the vast majority of your absorption of nutrients and um, you know a lot of that, those processes occur within your small intestine. And obviously it's very long, which means that if you have an interruption of your absorptive processes, you get malabsorption and um, you know, you're going to have big problems essentially. So what happens is that when you have an obstruction in your small intestine, you then undergo this process called third spacing of fluid. So you get the pooling of loads and loads of fluid in your small intestine. That fluid is meant to be intravascular, that fluid is meant to be spreading nicely, you know, following our homeostatic rules into your intra and extracellular spaces, etc. But instead, because there's an obstruction, within small intestine where loads of fluid is now pooling because the small bowel is involved in so many of these absorptive processes, you then become very tachycardic, you become very hypotensive because that fluid is moving from your intravascular space into your gut. So your gut lumen is now full of fluid. And that is why these patients become tachycardic and hypotensive. And also anatomically, we said the small intestine is proximal to the large intestine. And that is why vomiting occurs more 
early in small bowel obstruction than large bowel obstruction. Good. So important causes of small bowel obstruction. Well, we've, we've talked a lot about bowel adhesions. Here are some other key causes. Incarcerated hernias. Well, an incarcerated hernia, I'm going to show you on the next slide, I think, what that looks like. But really, any her all a hernia is is protrusion of your bowel contents through your abdominal wall. When that occurs, your that hernia can then become strangulated and it can actually cause small bowel obstruction. The hernia with the highest rates of small bowel obstruction are femoral hernias. Femoral hernias should basically always be managed surgically as soon as possible because of those high rates of strangulation, those high rates of incarceration, and therefore high rates of small bowel obstruction. Femoral hernias are more common in women, and um, inguinal hernias can also cause small bowel obstruction, but less commonly than a femoral hernia. Crohn's disease, obviously, as hopefully you all remember, Crohn's disease can affect any part of your gastrointestinal tract, and that includes your small bowel. You get loads of inflammation in your small bowel. You can form strictures, which can then act as the cause of your obstruction. Volvulus most commonly occurs in the large bowel, but small bowel or volvulus, where um, you know a piece of bowel essentially twists upon its mesentery. That can also occur in your um, your small bowel as well. Intersusception, which is telescoping of bowel um, from one portion onto the next, can occur, but is much more common in children and less common in adults. And then ileus is this concept of functional bowel obstruction, functional small bowel obstruction. This is when there is no mechanical problem with the bowel, there is no mechanical blockage to your small bowel but it is functional. Similar to how irritable bowel syndrome is not, a is not a mechanical problem, it is a functional problem. That's the same concept here. Often, ileus occurs post-operatively, so for after a major operation. And one reason why we think ileus occurs is when you have a major operation, your body goes into sympathetic overdrive, and obviously, as you remember, your parasympathetic nervous system is involved in that whole rest and digest process. When you have parasympathetic overdrive, your peristaltic action within your gut reduces and you get a functional small bowel obstruction. And that is managed differently to a mechanical small bowel obstruction. And I'll touch on the differences between the two. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. For everyone interested in slides and things, if they're not already uploaded, I will upload them as soon as uh, we finish here today. And although you'll find them just underneath where you're watching this webinar now with, with on the Bite Medicine website. Um, or alternatively, you can actually look at the previous General Surgical Emergencies webinar and the same slides will be there as well. So incarcerated attorneys we've touched on, remember intestinal pr protrusion here, um, that can become trapped and cause small bowel obstruction. And that is what a hernia looks like. And I am a massive fan, and by medicine, really, are a massive fan of linking pathophysiology with symptoms. Such a vital thing to be able to do. So we've got this peristalsis against obstruction. That's what's causing these symptoms here. You get dilatation of your proximal bowel. You get compression of vessels. You get fluid building up in your bowel lumen. And that's your third spacing process. So patients become dehydrated, tachycardic, hypotensive. You get a compromise of your arterial supply to your bowel. You get ischemia. You can get perforation. You then get all that delightful stuff in your small bowel then leaking out into your abdominal cavity. You can get fecal peritonitis, sepsis, multi-organ failure, shock, and death. And that is a very simple summary of your pathophysiology and how it all links in with the symptoms that these patients also develop as well. And this whole process down here, right at the bottom, is what we're trying to avoid. Okay, so we've talked a lot about signs and symptoms already, and really most of these we've touched on, you know, that colicky abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting as an early feature, bloating as well, um, abdominal, uh, sorry, absolute constipation, so inability to pass flatus or feces is a late symptom in small bowel obstruction. 
And that is obviously because the small bowel is proximal to the large bowel. Your signs are very similar. We've talked about tinkling bowel sound. Your rectal examination, often from the rectum, will be empty and um, tachycardia hypotensive because of all that third spacing of fluid into your uh, lumen of your gut. And hopefully, the key thing is in your mind being able to link that pathophysiology with those signs, symptoms, and how I have an understanding of how these patients deteriorate. So going back to this lovely 60-year-old lady who is pretty unwell, um, we need to fix her, sort her out, and get a better you know, hold of her observations, basically. So we've done an x-ray. This is what the x-ray looks like. Take a close look at that x-ray. Hopefully, I'm going to ask a question on it on Menti in a second, but hopefully you can see some features which suggest why this is small bowel rather than large bowel. Um, if you are having struggle interpreting x-rays, take a look at our abdominal x-ray webinar where I, I go into more detail about how we interpret uh, abdominal films. So the question here is, what bowel diameter suggests small bowel dilatation on imaging? So heading over to Menti again, have a go at this question. What bowel diameter suggests small bowel dilatation on imaging? When we're talking about imaging, we're talking about abdominal x-ray in this case, of course. What small bowel diameter? Okay, good. That's what I like to see. Confident bunch, 70%. The other one, other people were saying six, uh, six centimeters. So um, I will explain that cutoff to you. The key rule here is your three, six, nine rule. We generally say when we do an abdominal film like this, when it, you open up, up on your computer on packs, you can then measure the uh, diameter of your small bowel and your large bowel, which is more peripherally over here, and your cecum, which is normally down there on the right. When you measure it, you're particularly looking for this 369 rule. The small bowel should measure less than three centimeters, large bowel less than six centimeters, and cecum less than nine centimeters. Um, so that is, those are the rules to be aware of. Anything more than that, we're thinking bowel dilatation. Okay, so moving on to some investigations for that lovely lady. So, you know, we would have fluid resuscitated her, improved her observations, etc. She's more stable, we've done an abdo film, we've done, we've done some more investigations here. So these are the types of things we need to do. Whenever you think about investigations, try and think bedside, bloods, imaging, and then interventional tests as well. So bloods, full blood count, you'd expect raised white cell count, neutrophilia. Use the knees, well, you're losing all that fluid from your intravascular space and it's going into your, your small bowel now because it's pooling in your gut. As such, you're probably going to have a relatively reduced perfusion to your kidneys and you can develop a pre-renal acute kidney injury. As such, you can also then develop really significant electrolyte imbalances as well. And um, also importantly, if you're thinking, you know, is this an ileus rather than a mechanical obstruction? Well, electrolyte imbalances can also cause ileus as well. So that is something to also be aware of and to correct as required. CRP is usually going to be raised. Always group and save these patients. Make sure you have two valid group and save so you know the blood type of the patient and any a weird and wonderful antibodies they may have because they may require transfusion and they may require going to theatre. Always do a venous blood gas, nice, beautiful, quick test that you can do, particularly looking at things like your lactate, your pH, a quick snapshot of any electrolyte abnormalities like sodium and potassium as well. So those are the key bloods we're going to be doing in the first instance. Imaging. Well, there still remains this controversy. What is the best first line imaging um, in conditions like small bowel obstruction? The general surgeon is always going to say, why are we doing abdominal x-rays? They are not useful tests. We should go straight to a CT, which is a totally reasonable 
a thing for someone to say, you know, if an abdominal film suggests bowel obstruction, you're going to need a CT anyway to diagnose it. Um, whereas um, radiologists would always say, you know, you want to do the test with the least ionizing radiation possible that can give you some clinical idea as to what's causing the patient's symptoms. So, you know, in suspected bowel obstruction, abdominal x-rays can still be performed. They often still are performed first line and you're looking for those dilated loops and fluid levels, etc. In real clinical practice, often a CT abdo and pelvis with contrast is often performed straight away because it will give you the most reliable information and can be used to guide preoperative planning as well. You're rarely going to have any general surgeon rush a patient to theatre to operate on them without having a CT first. So um, that's something to just, just to have in the back of your mind. There's a slight discrepancy there between theory and actual clinical practice. Okay, a couple of investigations to consider. Um, well, erect chest x-ray, really any patient with acute onset abdominal pain, you're going to get an erect chest x-ray on to see for any evidence, particularly of pneumoperitoneum, so free air under the diaphragm, which may suggest intra-abdominal perforation, so perforated bowel, perforated ulcer, etc. Contrast studies, as a junior doctor, as a PA, you're not going to be requesting regularly. These are not, it's not a test I personally requested, but can be done um, to perform, can be done to essentially assess where that obstruction is um, and get a better idea. So like a, a, an oral like swallow, so gastrographin swallow, for example, um, and you then take serial x-rays. It can also be used as a therapeutic measure as well, which I'll touch on a little bit later. But really, um, these are the key things to be, the key tests here, and then also an erect chest x-ray in these patients. Um, a few questions in the Q&A, which I will touch on probably at the end, if that's okay, because they're very good questions. Now, this is a, a really tricky question. Um, it's more that you're aware of what this is than anything else. Can anyone hazard a guess what this CT is showing? It is far beyond what you expected to know at medical school, but um, it's more the concept here. So there's... The Daniel said air fluid levels, you're not, you know, you, you actually, you know, you're, you're not wrong. You know, there are definitely fluid levels. I totally agree. There are fluid levels and they've also got this mention of air as well. And to be honest, okay, there we go. Ryan has smashed it. Pneumatosis. That is exactly what this is. Pneumatosis intestinalis. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Who else said that? Ryan. Uh, and really everyone is almost correct because you've got air where it shouldn't be and you've got fluid levels. So this is pneumatosis. Pneumatosis is essentially um, intramural gas within your gut, with, and there should not usually be any air in that intramural space, kind of between the submucosa and the subserosa as well. When you have, and, and that's kind of shown here, kind of these lines, it's, it's hard for me to demonstrate on here, but if, you know, these, these blackish areas where there shouldn't be air, um, air has now pooled and fought, well not pooled, but air is now um, present. And this suggests ischemia, it suggests ongoing necrosis and you know, damage to your gut essentially. Why this occurs, we're not entirely sure. There's some uh, theories about um, kind of CO2 producing bacteria, which when you have ischemic bowel gut, then um, kind of migrates into your muscle. Um, that's one theory, but this is a really kind of cardinal feature of bowel obstruction because it suggests that ongoing bowel ischemia and necrosis are, are taking place. The pneumatosis intestinalis, as Daniel and Ryan wonderfully said. Um, and you know, particularly looking and tracking where that air is going, is it going towards the portal vein, etc., is something which your, your general surgical consultant is probably always going to be mentioning. So uh, just so you're aware, that is what this is. Now, moving on to management, if you're going to take anything away from this webinar, take away this quote. Never let the sun rise or set on small bowel obstruction. So you are the F1, you are the PA, you are seeing a patient you think has small bowel obstruction. You have to do something. I'm not saying every single patient needs to go to theatre straight away. That is not the case. A lot of patients can be managed conservatively. What I'm saying is do not 
leave a patient you think has small bowel obstruction. We're going to need to do at least some conservative management. We're going to be needing to give them fluid. We need to give them antibiotics. We may need to put an NG tube in. You know, these are key things that you're going to need to do. And then if that all fails, then yes, the patient may need to go to theater. There are some other indications for theater as well, but this is the key quote to remember. So let's go into more detail about bowel obstruction. Does anyone know what these two um, images or you know, diagrams mention? Yes, thank you. Lots of people, perfect. Maruf, yes, absolutely. Drip and suck. Drip and suck is your main line, kind of mainstay of treatment in kind of small bowel and large bowel obstruction, particularly small bowel obstruction, but is used in both. We give fluids, these patients, like we've talked about, and I've drum drummed home this message constantly now, these patients are third spacing fluid, their fluid is pooling in their gut, which is not where it should be, and you then need to resuscitate these patients with several liters of fluid very often. They are very intravascularly depleted. Lots of Hartmann's, lots of, um, you know, making sure that they are also not dropping their, their um, glucose levels as well. So do supplement that as required, give them a bit of dextrose if they need. But the initial fluid resuscitation of choice is going to be Hartmann's. And they need really accurate uh, fluid balance as well. So that's the drip part of it. The suck is popping an NG tube in, um, or, or more specifically a Riles tube. And the Riles tube is for decompression uh, of the abdomen. You want to decompress all of that pressure that is building up because of that obstruction. Um, so that is drip and suck. And particularly if patients are vomiting, we need to decompress their abdomen. We don't want them to, like, to get an aspiration pneumonia. So that's your drip and suck. A little bit more detail. Well, we've talked about fluid resuscitation. Obviously, analgesia these patients, give them antiemetics, NG tube, Riles tube and antibiotics, um, particularly prophylactically. Um, surgical management, well, you're going to need to do an emergency laparotomy if this patient's going to go to theatre. But not all patients need to go to theatre, as we've talked about. If there is evidence of bowel ischemia, you need to take this patient to theatre, and they're going to need a bit of their bowel resected. If there is a non-adhesional cause, i.e., not due to bowel, suspected bowel adhesions, and it's due to something like a hernia, for example, these patients are going to need to go to theatre. If you have a strangulated hernia, you need to go to theatre. Or if there is failure of your conservative management. All patients with bowel obstruction need serial venous blood gases. Their lactate should be improving. Their pH should be improving. If it's not, they may require theatre. They often require serial abdominal x-rays and serial CT scans. If those aren't improving, they're going to need to go to theatre. And along with the, the bowel resection, you know, patients with adhesional small bowel obstruction undergo a procedure called adhesiolysis, where you uh, kind of break, basically try and break down all of those bowel adhesions, but they can still reoccur despite that. So often patients with adhesional small bowel obstruction, they may present on a recurrent basis. So I think I saw a patient once with adhesional small bowel obstruction that had like three rounds of adhesiolysis to break down those adhesions. Um, and this was like her seventh admission with adhesional small bowel obstruction. So adhesiolysis is not curative. It just reduces your risk of recurrent episodes of adhesional small bowel obstruction. Okay, back to this lady here. So the final question, I think, on small bowel obstruction. So we've got done this lady. She has, the patient requires small bowel resection of a significant proportion of her bowel. Postoperatively, she is discharged, returns to clinic complaining of loose stools and crampy abdominal pain. What do we think the cause is? Someone's asked in the Q&A, um, if it's an exam question, what is the answer for the first line investigation of imaging, I'm assuming, uh, imaging of, of um, small bowel obstruction? First line, for exam purposes, I would still probably put abdominal x-ray. In reality, patients usually go, or very often do still do go for CT first. But for exams, I would still recommend abdominal x-ray. <clears throat> 
Okay, let's see. Ooh, a little bit of a split there. But yes, the majority are correct. This is a condition called short gut syndrome, as suggested by the name. She's had a significant proportion of her bowel chopped. She now has a short gut and has developed short gut syndrome. Excuse me. When a significant proportion of your bowel has been resected, when your small bowel is reduced in size from that wonderful six meter length, they obviously patients are then going to be at risk of malabsorption and they often present very similar to this diarrhea, cramping, abdominal pain. Um, dumping syndrome was another kind of split there in the answers that we gave. Uh, this is rapid gastric emptying due to fast transit from stomach to duodenum, uh, more associated with gastric and esophageal surgery. So that's a little bit about short gut syndrome. Finally, complications. We've, talked, we've touched on all of these, really. Bowel ischemia, perforation, you know, fecal peritonitis, sepsis, multi-organ failure, your aspiration pneumonias, short gut syndrome. Nice and easy. Moving on to case-based discussion number two. I will take all questions right at the end as well, um, just in the interest of time. But hopefully you're all keeping up and uh, you're learning a lot as we go along. So number two, we now have a 70 year old male who's presented to the emergency department with generalized abdominal pain, inability to pass fleetus or feces for the past five days. Background of Parkinson's disease and hypertension. Those are his OBS. What do we think about the OBS here in this case? What are the, any abnormalities that you note? So yeah, tachy. Tachy is uh, is the biggest thing here. Tachycardia. So if you remember, if you remember how patients usually compensate when they're losing their intravascular fluid, when when patients start to decompensate and go into shock, blood pressure often drops relatively late. Um, but also, as Uaglani has said, we've got a low BP in a hypertensive patient patient who is usually hypertensive probably should, wouldn't have a systolic of 110. So they have a relative hypotension and a tachycardia, which certainly is concerning. So we think this is large bowel obstruction. Hopefully you've all got that. Um, and I'll explain why in a second, but what is the most likely cause of this underlying diagnosis? Does anybody know? Head over to Menti and we can do this question. Likely cause, uh, the most common cause even, of large bowel obstruction. Okay, let's have a look. We okay, yeah, just about once again, majority are correct. Yes, the most common cause of a large bowel obstruction is colorectal cancer. Always remember that, always comes up in exams as well. So, you know, fecal volvulus, yes, can cause it. Strictures, yes, can cause it. Toxic megacolon is actually a non-obstructive dilatation of your large bowel. Um, so technically it's not large bowel obstruction, it's not a, a mechanical obstruction, it's more kind of really significant toxic dilatation. Um, good, but yes, colorectal cancer. So we've touched on the, the uh, heart rate and the blood pressure. For, for anyone asking in the chat there, I just saw pop up about relative hypertension. In a patient, I think you just need to remember this, in patients who have a background of hypertension, if their blood pressure is on the low side, then we're even more concerned than we would be otherwise because they usually will have a blood pressure which is slightly supranormal and now they are low. So their, their level of compensation is slowly, slowly dropping more so than a patient who is normally kind of normotensive. Parkinson's disease that can actually predispose you to large bowel obstruction as well. So neuropsychiatric conditions, large bowel obstruction is associated with, um, and also constipation in general is also associated with Parkinson's disease. Generalized abdominal pain and this, you know, absolute constipation is characteristic of also of large bowel obstruction. So, you know, large bowel obstruction essentially the identical definition to 
small bar obstruction, but replacing large with, uh, sorry, small with large. Epidemiology and risk factors, increasing age is a key risk factor alongside colorectal cancer and all the risk factors, of course, associated with colorectal cancer as well. So things like smoking, obesity, processed meats. Strictures, so diverticulitis, which is inflammation of out pouches in your large bowel. When they become inflamed, they can cause narrowing or strictures, and that can also cause large bowel obstruction. And then volvulus, which is twisting of your large bowel upon its mesentery, um, is associated with neuropsychiatric conditions and chronic constipation, and also, you know, most commonly, again, in, in very old patients. But remember, colorectal cancer being the most common cause of large bowel obstruction. So we've touched on this, we've touched on this, and we've touched on that. So when it comes to volvulus, sigmoid volvulus is far more common than sequel volvulus as well, just something to note. Okay, so once again, linking our pathophysiology with our symptoms, there is some overlap here with small bowel obstruction. So large bowel, we've got an obstruction against the outflow of large bowel contents. This causes your abdominal pain, your distension. And obviously when your obstruction is more distal, i.e. distal to your small bowel and then in your large bowel essentially, you then are more likely to get absolute constipation earlier. And hopefully that makes sense for everyone because the large bowel is distal to the small bowel and you get an obstruction in your large bowel, you're less likely to be able to pass feces and pass flatus uh, easily compared to small bowel obstruction. In this process, you get dilation of your proximal bowel and essentially the same process we described previously. A key point to remember here is remember that the majority of your absorption of your fluid, your electrolytes, um, etc., occurs in your small bowel. Yes, the large bowel is involved in kind of dehydrating your feces and sucking out those last bits of fluid, but the majority of your absorption takes place in your small bowel. So therefore, this th process of third spacing and losing loads of fluid is far more significant in small bowel obstruction. So yes, patients with large bowel obstruction do become dehydrated, they do become hypertensive, etc. This actually occurs more kind of kind of a little bit earlier in the small bowel obstruction than large bowel in general. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Now. Moving on to kind of a summary of our clinical features. Well, we've touched once again on a lot of these generalized abdominal pain, bloating, constant, absolute constipation, which occurs earlier in large bowel obstruction than small bowel obstruction. And then vomiting occurs later in large bowel obstruction. And that's because the large bowel is more distal to the small bowel. So you're more likely to have things not be able to come out of the bottom than coming out of the top excessively. Abdominal tenderness, once again, tinkling bowel sounds. Does anyone know when we might hear absent bowel sounds in the context of bowel and obstruction in general? When might we hear absent bowel sounds? Perfect, Ryan, absolutely. Absent bowel sounds are associated with ileus. Remember, ileus is a functional small bowel obstruction. There is no tinkling. Tinkling occurs when there is a mechanical obstruction that the gut is trying to push against. That causes that really high-pitched tinkling noise. When there is a functional obstruction in ileus, there are just no bowel sounds. There is no peristalsis taking place. So that's a key thing, particularly from an academic and textbook and exam point of view to remember. Rectal exam, empty rectum on the whole, and then tachycardia and hypertension as well. Does anyone know what this abdominal x-ray is demonstrating? Good. Uliglani said volvulus. Can anyone be a little bit more specific? Sigmoid volvulus. Perfect. So we've got all the answers I was looking for there. We've got sigmoid volvulus, which is what this condition is. And then Ryan has said coffee. And Maruf has said coffee bean sign. That is what this is as well. So what we call this is coffee bean sign. It looks like a coffee bean, particularly if you tilt your head a bit sideways, it looks like a coffee bean. And this is characteristic of sigmoid volvulus. Nice. So moving on to our investigation of large bowel obstruction, a big overlap once again with small bowel obstruction. So for the same reasons, full blood count, user needs, CRP, venous blood gas group and save. I'm not going to go into all those reasons again because 
as I said, they're identical reasoning to, uh, to small bowel obstruction. Imaging, abdominal film, once again, we get to that controversy, which one do we do first, abdo film, CT. Uh, once again, I'd recommend for exams, put abdo film first line in clinical practice, often CT abdomen pelvis is done first. Abdo films are one of my least favorite investigations. They don't, they're not particularly useful. Um, and the Royal Society of Radiologists, the Royal College of Radiologists, they have very specific indications for abdominal x-rays. And technically, suspected bowel obstruction is still on that list, hence why we still do abdo films for, for bowel obstruction. And remember, we're looking for more than six centimeters in the colon for suspected large bowel obstruction or more than nine centimeters at the cecum. So that's just your three, six, nine rule once again. Investigations to consider once again, any patient with, you know, particularly acute onset abdominal pain is going to need a erect chest x-ray to look for perforation. Contrast enema is done, it can be done for large bowel obstruction. Once again, it's not, not something I necessarily uh, organize myself. Um, and you're unlikely to organize that yourself. Your, your priority is all those other investigations, but you, you basically apply a water-soluble contrast rectally, and then you can see the evidence, any evidence of obstruction if those previous investigations are inconclusive. Once again, drip and suck. It's, it's obviously still important in large bowel obstruction as well. We want to decompress the abdomen, particularly if patients are vomiting, so we pop our NG or Ryles tube in, Patients are tachycardic, hypotensive, they're losing fluid, we want to replace that. Okay, so remember we got the 70 year old chap with Parkinson's. Um, we did those abdominal film, it showed sigmoid volvulus. We've done a CT abdopelvis with contrast, it confirmed sigmoid volvulus. So let's see who knows how to manage sigmoid volvulus. There are numerous causes of large bowel obstruction, and um, I will touch on what all these other procedures are as well. Good. Nice. 50% of you said rigid sigmoidoscopy and platelet tube insertion, with others saying particularly Hartman's procedure. We don't need to necessarily do a Hartman's for volvulus. It's not, not always not really done. It's going to be first line generally in the stable patient particularly it's going to be rigid sigmoidoscopy and flatus tube insertion essentially to try and uh, and resolve that that volvulus Harmons is an emergency procedure which is done which is exactly as described here um you know resection of erector sigmoid closure of an erector stump and you form an end colostomy so it can be done in volvulus if that volvulus has resulted, or you know, there's evidence of ischemia, there's evidence of bowel, you know, gut has perforated, etc., you may consider it. But um, we are going to, on the, you know, in the stable patient, you can treat initially with decompression by sigmoidoscope and insert a flatus tube to decompress. So those are, and if you haven't heard of some of these other procedures or when you're going to do them, I will show you now when you would do some of those other procedures. We've touched on all of this conservative management, so everyone should be confident about with all of these, but it's this concept of how do we treat all of these different causes of large bowel obstruction? Well, we know colon cancer is the most common cause, but colorectal cancer is obviously then split up into colon cancer and into rectal cancer. This is going slightly beyond kind of, you know, those, those kind of second third year medical school or early years as a PA uh, and this is more a little bit more advanced final year stuff here. So colorectal cancer is split up into colon cancer and rectal cancer. In the emergency setting of large bowel obstruction colon cancer and rectal cancer are managed very very differently. Colon cancer, if a patient has colon cancer and large bowel obstruction in the acute setting we can often just resect it. So you chop it out, you can form a stoma, and you know, in summary, that's essentially a Hartman's procedure. 
you know, and, and that, so, so the key thing there is that colon cancer, you can resect in the acute setting, even if you haven't, it hasn't been fully staged. If, even if you haven't done all your staging investigations, you can chop it out or you can stent it, you know, if, if that's, an, that's also an option. In rectal cancer, you can't just chop out the cancer. If you chop out a rectal cancer that has not been fully staged, and you do that in the emergency setting, you're going to leave cancer behind. You're going to leave bits of cancer, and that cancer is then going to spread and disseminate, and you're going to have really poor resection margins. So you never resect a rectal cancer that has caused large bowel obstruction unless it has already been staged. In colon cancer, you can do that. And do look at our textbook. It gives a very kind of more detailed explanation of that process. So in rectal cancer, we just want to relieve the pressure that's being caused. And we do something called a defunctioning colostomy. It's essentially diverting feces away from that obstruction into a bag, collecting your feces. You then want to fully stage your rectal cancer so you know what approach to take, exactly what needs to be resected, how much that cancer is spread. So rectal cancer, you would not resect in the, in the emergency setting. Diverticular disease, well, we've got Harman's as an option as well. Sigmoid volvulus, first line, as we talked about in the stable patient, is rigid sigmoidoscope. Cecal volvulus, it usually requires surgery and often is going to be done with a right hemicolectomy, so chopping off kind of the right side of the portion of your large bowel. And then if there's an unclear cause, cut the patient down the middle, find out what's going on, also known as an exploratory laparotomy. The key thing there is that, yes, some of you may be a little bit confused about this colon cancer, rectal cancer bit. You can look back at the previous recording on general surgical emergencies where I go into once again a bit more detail, but also just take a read of our textbook and it, and it, makes, it will make complete sense to you, hopefully. As we come to the end now, complications, prognosis, very similar to um, small bowel obstruction. Of course, all those other bits, things like shock, et cetera, fecal peritonitis, once you perforate, all of those are common in large, not common, but shared between uh, small bowel and large bowel obstruction. Good. That is a rundown, very, well, 45 minutes, 50 minutes since we started of small bowel and large bowel obstruction. I would love to cover some of these next time. Um, things like your appendicitis, perforated peptic ulcer, et cetera, with the MSA, but also these have been recorded on our, on, on our platform as well. So if you did want to check those out, obviously you can use my promo code as well, Azeem2021 for an additional discount, but loads of our stuff is free anyway. Um, and yeah, please check out our question bank, as I said, textbook. And um, thank you so, so much for sticking around till the end, all of you.